and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming post-apocalyptic romp, Rainwall. And the, and the man who, who opens it up with, the world is dead, according to the BBC. Daniel Donch, the one and only. How are you doing tonight, man? Well, I'm doing great, man. It's great to be in a different shit show than I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. So... Also to also to make a bit of an in, make a bit of a um, in reference to your to your setting, fuck Simon. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, man, he's uh, he's the one that everyone blames mm -hmm. for the end of the world. So there's graffiti everywhere. <laughs> so with that with that said, it's a bit of a tradition to open up with the humble beginnings in a sense. With that yeah. in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Well, so this was probably mid-90s. Uh, I had a friend. So I lived in the country. My friend that rode the bus with me every day, I noticed that one day a week he was not on the bus. And I kept asking him, like, hey, man, what? where were you? <laughs> And he said he, he was at role playing game club. And I was like, what is that? And he tried to explain it. Um, but I just went. So I, I, I went to role playing games club with him, which he had started it. And then uh, he was a terrible DM. <laughs> terrible. Uh, every game we did was either a mech game or this homebrew game that he would have uh he would bring us all together basically every session was us players trying to kill this super badass creature or robot that he had put together like arena style and it was always impossible to kill him every time um and i kept asking him do, do you ever play dungeons and dragons um because i had just finished reading the lord of the rings so I was deep into the fantasy stuff, and D and D sounded. I mean, I had seen about it. Like on, if you remember ET, they're playing it in the very beginning. Uh, and he's like, "Yeah," but he kept putting it off. Well, fast forward a few months, I actually ended up in this foster home that was in the country as well, with no nothing to do whatsoever. And I found a copy of the player's guide and the GM, the DM guide used at a bookstore. And so I saved up, bought them both, brought them home, and ended up trying to get other people to play with me. As I was just put together a campaign, nobody wanted to play. So I made a full party. <laughs> Back then, they only had like six or seven classes or whatever. I mm -hmm. made a full party, and I just played every character, and I jammed for myself. <laughs> so I think from then, I was like hooked on just the concept of role-playing games. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. given, now, given that, given that, obviously, when I look at the setup that you have with um, Rainfall, which... Rainfall, from from what I've been able to surmise, obviously, is a post-apocalyptic type of game, and correct, yeah. Given that, I'm curious what I'm curious what inspired you to go that that route, go with the route of a post-apocalypse. Was that was that a um, play style that you were delving into up until that point, or was it just a result of the movies and um, other media that you happen to like? Yeah, actually, uh, that's my favorite genre across the board. Uh, I mean, I love Fallout. 
the Last of Us type games, The Division was mm-hmm. kind of post apocalyptic. The those kind of movies, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Mad Max. Uh, I don't know, they just resonated with me on a different level than fantasy. Like I'm kind of not in the fantasy anymore. I mean, I'll still read a, a thing or two, but that one has captivated me for years. So the original idea was to make a game for a sci-fi setting that I had written a couple stories for. But uh, as I was going through, I realized it probably wasn't going to work out. Like I just, it was going to be a hard sell basically uh, that particular setting. Mm -hmm. So I, I adapted it to a different setting that let me uh let me back up so back in 2012 i was trying to make short films as well um and i had written this script it was a post-apocalyptic script and i was like okay i want to make this short film in the apocalypse but i want it to be different than anything i've ever seen what could i do Mm -hmm. and the idea behind that was you have this one guy he's the main protagonist and he's living in a world that was destroyed by one guy simon (laughs) that's where the fuck simon comes from Mm -hmm. and you go through this and the idea was i would have this film and you go through and then at the end you find out that he is simon um but he feels bad (laughs) <laughs> so I just we we filmed the whole thing but I never got it finished and so that story sat with me for a few years and then it just kind of clicked like hey I could take the idea for this RPG I needed a different setting Apocalypse is my favorite let's just start there and mm-hmm. so that's kind of what I did I adapted that setting you know I made up some more stuff for it of course to flesh it all out and then I've actually just been kind of working on the mechanics for a few years, trying to get those tweaked. Because every time I play, there's something else that just doesn't feel right. And uh, you can't just ignore that. Mm-hmm. If you have like a gut feeling, you can't ignore it. You have to look into why something's not working. So. And... When it comes to when it comes to it being a post apocalypse. Now obviously not all post apocalyptic stories are created equal. And everyone has their di- has their different take on what exactly caused the bomb to drop. For some it's obvious for some it's the whole zombie thing. For some it's a mimetic virus. For some it's um spo- it's spores from a meteorite. So I had to bring up the Genesis at one point because not enough people do. Um, and some and sometimes it's all of the above, like with something like Maximum Apocalypse. Um, what what caused the world to go to, for lack of a better term, go to shit in the setting of Rainwall? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So Rainwall is actually the name of a government project a secret government project that the idea for that was they were trying to infuse animal dna into human to kind of enhance their abilities Mm -hmm. that was part part of it um the this operation had several different subgroups that were experimenting on human volunteers and at that point they weren't actually volunteers anymore They were more like prisoners. Um, But you had like surgical procedures. Uh, They experimented with nanotechnology. All any any possible way you could to. In essence, change a a human's capabilities and make them better Mm -hmm. was tried. In fact, some combinations. But the idea of Rainwall is that. During one of these tests, they made a genetic mutagen the idea was you could inject a human and uh, their DNA would become altered through this mutagen. But 
what happened was, I don't know if you know this, but we all basically carry these dormant viruses. Mm -hmm. Chicken pox. We all have chicken pox. Uh, it basically, this mutagen also mutated this chicken pox that was within one of the test subjects. So there's the creation of this new virus unintentionally from this project. And then the second phase was all these test subjects eventually realized that this wasn't a good thing. Um, they were subjected to some pretty horrific uh, things. And then they realized, hey, we, we have enhanced capabilities and our own human intellect is intact. They discovered that they were stronger than their captors, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So essentially they coerced or convinced this guy Simon to help them escape um, the facility and so that's where you get these crazy creatures because I figured just having an apocalypse with no monsters would be boring so I have the monsters escaping the facility and then in the process they release this genetically mutated virus and that's what wipes everybody out uh in this setting yeah and given given the fact that within the within the setting you you have several di several different um nation states within and i will admit that this this would have been easier in hindsight if i if i had a if I had a map to look at, but you have, you have the you have a collection of nation states instead of what what I'm assuming is in the territory of um, North America. And right. yeah, there is a map on the wiki, but it, yeah, it's, I have a wiki that mm -hmm. I kind of keep all my notes in, or else I would get lost too. Mm -hmm. But what I'm cur what I'm curious about with with them is now first off I can I kind of hinted at this but it's good it's good to know if this is actually the case um, the setting that would be in the book for Rainwall that mainly takes place in North America correct yes correct now is it North America as a whole or is, or does it focus primarily on the area where the United States are. Yeah, so it, right now it would focus on the former United States, mm -hmm. which is now a new – they've created a new government. Um, essentially what happened was after the collapse of civilization, you have all these people trying to vie for power in a vacuum, mm -hmm. naturally. Uh, different factions trying to take control. You've got one group up in Idaho because <laughs> – I just feel like Idaho is a perfect place for a giant militia to just establish their own like colony. So there's a there's a state up there called Jero because the leader is named Jerome. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a group like that. Texas became its own country the first chance they got um, because I felt like that would be pretty realistic. <laughs> Uh, they just are like waiting for the right time. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear my dogs. So I... if, if they bark, <laughs> I'll just pause for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're barking in the hallway. Um, but yeah, the uh, the thing is, like several months after the collapse of society, you've got all these different factions rising up and trying to seize power, at least in the local areas where they are. Um, cause I feel like it's more like a warlord type setup rather than somebody just trying to seize control of the whole nation. But the remaining members of the former U S government, which is only like a handful of survivors there decided that it would be best to not bring back the United States mm -hmm. because they were blamed for all of this. They, because the word got out, like, hey, they were doing these experiments. 
And so instead of bring back the United States, they kind of did a rebrand and they made it a just they just created a new government, the Federation of New American States. Um, and they kind of did a PR push saying, hey, we're bringing back society. We're going to help you. We are we are going to fix everything um, kind of to sweep everything under the rug and redirect people and re- direct their focus on to reconstructing everything. So, but the thing is, it's not, per, it's not like a, an established nation per se. It's more like if, if I lived in a mansion that got destroyed in a hurricane and you and a couple of my neighbors came over mm-hmm. and you were like, don't worry, we're going to rebuild your house for you it probably wouldn't be the same as it was before. So that's kind of what this is. It, there is a country, um, but as however strong that is, it's up to anybody's guess. It's pretty, pretty weak right now. And when it comes to the, when it comes to the, um, fe- the Federation, how much, t- what would, what would the territory that they'd have, um, that they'd encompass as far as their control or do, or is it a case where they see the whole of the former U S as the, as their, ter- as their turf and everybody else is, um, is unofficial in their eyes. Yeah. The second one. So basically they, they just wanted to make everything as easy as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they just took the former United States. They said, okay, this is the new Federation now but we're going to break it up into 11 states instead of, you know, 50 because it's easier to govern when you have less people, I guess Mm -hmm. you just have a bigger territory. Um, And of course, Texas is not involved in that. And there's a couple of pockets where there's definite independent territories. Um, Like I said, Jero is one and there's a couple of huge, uh, Native American, I guess, former reservations that decided <laughs> we're not going to join. We're not going to do that again. They're independent, but they're kind of within the territory that the new Federation claimed. And then, of course, all, all across the former United States is little pockets of people that say, hey, this is my kingdom. But is it? I don't know. And and of course, people, there are people who don't recognize the new government as legit either. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's kind of what I wanted to really incorporate in the game. It's like, how would we know? <laughs> I mean, every, anybody could say, right? Like, hey, we, we're in, char- in charge here. This is a nation that we made versus the, and you never, you would never know is the point. I think that's the whole point of the confusion. And that's kind of what I want to amp up in the game. Which I can, I can definitely get behind that kind of thing. Um, and when it, the main reason that I focused on the Federation in this, in this instance is obviously I've had a bit, I've had a bit of a dabble here and there with, um, Shadowrun. And I could see somebody um, comparing the Federation of New American States to the UCAS in Shadowrun, the um, American and Canadian states. But it's clear that that's not exactly oh, not, what okay, you're going yeah. for. Um, now, when it comes now, when it comes to the when it comes to the other when it comes to the other ones, the the um, the two that I'm cu- the two states that I'm curious about. That you that you have have some notes on is the realm of Enora and the Republic of Texas. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, Texas. I feel like I I've always got the impression Texas just wanted to be left alone. They want to do their own thing. They want to succeed, but I guess according to the laws, they they can't. Supreme Court said they mm-hmm. can't. Um, so in this setting, 
the first <laughs> when when society collapsed, Texas just said, <clears throat> "Okay, now we can. We're our own nation now because the U.S. doesn't exist." And that's all they did. Um, they just became their own state. They're not like at war mm -hmm. with anybody. Um, in fact, according to the new federation, they 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 had Texas establish an embassy in Philadelphia because Washington D.C. doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I have to flesh out that I have to flesh out that uh, that scenario. But I, I know. When when the hybrids escaped the facility, there was a bit of mayhem, uh, and the government tried to contain that, but they had a hard time because these hybrids are not only human smart, but they're also they have better capabilities. So it was just a new new enemy that mm -hmm. we had a hard time with. And that was before the virus got out. It's that de that definitely makes sense, and now and of course now that I see it, I can actually see the map that you have, so I can see the way these states are set up. Um, a few of the, a few of them a few of these setups are very funny to me, like the the idea that Minnesota and Wisconsin would see eye to eye on anything, including being part of the same state. <laughs> but I might be a bit biased on that front because, well, I'm from Minnesota. Um, but when, but even, but even with that, I'm guessing in the case of DC, the, um, the idea that you have is that it, the, um, buildings around that place still exist. It's just that when everything went down, when everything went downhill, um, it ended up being this place that was just take, that was just taken over by the, by for l for lack of a better term the lawless folk and ju and just who as just a matter of who I who is the big gang in charge this week who's probably going to get wiped out and replaced by another gang and so and so on and so forth and hang on f hang on folks Sorry about that technical difficulties. Um, you were saying, yeah. So basically, uh, because a lot of people are vying for power all the time, because anybody can just claim that they're in charge. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't trust any government right now, and uh, that's kind of why some people subscribe to this idea that. There shouldn't be a government and there shouldn't be borders and all that stuff, which is where the conceptual realm of Enora comes in. Did I explain that adequately before? Um, a bit, but we but we could certainly go we could certainly go further into that if you'd like. Yeah, I just thought that in the apocalypse, uh, my the one of the challenges that I have with designing an apocalypse. And I think this applies to anybody trying to utilize that genre. Um, you have to come up with something that hasn't been done, something unique. Um, kind of like Fallout, they, they have the megaton that they're using all the airline parts. And then you have like the new Mad Max, Fury Road, with the guy and the guitar and the amps and the fire <laughs> like that dude to me was like the best highlight like who came up with that guy you know um so that's what the apocalypse is is fun because you get to create all these things that haven't been done before and one of those things i think is uh the realm of the nora basically it's just a conceptual place that people came up with uh as a way of sticking the middle finger to government and borders and things like that so basically they're just like i'm not a part of your government i don't believe you i am a sovereign citizen of enora and it's kind of like 
they're half for real and half joking, I guess. Kind of like the Church of the Spaghetti Monster. It's a satirical thing, but some people are in it for real, I guess. So that's what I got with the Realm of Venora. Um, it's it's for the people who don't want to claim allegiance to anybody, you know. Mm-hmm. And taking that taking that into uh, into account, um, now aside aside from the aside from the um cy- the cybrids the the uh, mo- the monsters out there, what how what are what other kind of threats could someone um, feasibly encounter when they're out in the wilderness? So yeah, that's that's the other thing that I kind of struggled mm-hmm. with, honestly, because I originally I had just a plain, straight up apocalypse, and mostly you're just dealing with other people, um, which is a big part of the game. It's you're trying to deal with all the other people that are trying to kill you for your stuff (laughs) or eat you maybe um but you have your typical wild animals and you have the cybrids which is what people call them the cybernetic hybrids i guess Mm -hmm. because of the nanotech it just sounded cool so people went with it uh and then the you also have what is called a twitcher um now, to be honest with you, I, I like the concept of zombies, right? Mm-hmm. A zombie apocalypse is fun, conceptually, because you have tons of things you can kill. There's zombies everywhere, etc. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to do zombies, because I feel like that might be overdone. So I came up with this concept of the Twitcher, which, if you think back on the virus that mutated um it kind of maybe kept a little bit of the mutagen properties if you will so Mm -hmm. when the virus spread um it either killed you outright or sometimes the virus kind of helps you uh mutate you're basically just a mutant um that doesn't retain its human intellect the way the hybrids do. So you just become this massive, random, part animal, part human thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what a twitcher is. Um, So you have those as well. So if you think cybers were created in a lab, in a controlled environment, very specific traits from an animal infused or put into this human and then you have the other end of the spectrum which is like the the same process but random you know because of the virus Mm -hmm. is that's the idea between behind the twitchers so you have those um in addition to so you have the hybrids and the twitchers plus humans and those are all the dangers basically all right, I can I can definitely get that. Now, within the within the um, game's mechanics, you're using what you refer to as the Artix system, A R T I X, I, be, I believe is how it's um, spelled. Now, yeah, Arctix, yeah. The fr- first thing that I'm first thing that I'm curious about is what what was the um, what was the inspiration for how you designed that system's um, sandbox. So, yeah, that's a very good question, too. Um, Initially, I was just trying to... I was inspired a lot by Fallout and how they created their game mechanics Mm -hmm. among the the video game, the special system. And then each each character trait worked with a specific skill and all that stuff. And I experimented with percentile dice in the very, very, very beginning. And uh, it was the most boring awful shit thing um, because lower level characters have you know you might have a skill of 10% (laughs) 12% and you very rarely succeed 
So I was like, well, this sucks. What can I do? Mm-hmm. And uh, the Arctic system came out, came about by accident. Basically, I wanted to use, I liked D10 because of their versatility. Um, they can be a, a 10 sided dice or you have the percentile dice, etc. And I, I don't, I, you can't just buy two anywhere here in town. So uh, I remember everywhere I looked, they either had the D and D, you know, dice with the D four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and twenty, mm-hmm. or they had sets of ten D tens everywhere here. And I was like, well, I'll just I'm gonna have to get a set of ten D tens. And so from there, I got them home, and as I was trying to fix this percentile dice problem. I was like, well, I like being able to roll more than two dice. What, how can I do this? And so I experimented with the dice pool of these D10s, and I figured out, well, if I can make the mechanic so that one stat tells you how many dice you can roll, the next stat tells you what you need to roll, then that's perfect. I, and I experimented with that a ton. And that's when I created Arctics, which simply stands for archetypes, traits, and influence, which are the three main um, game mechanics, basically. Um, the archetypes is just basic, your standard, like, it's like a class, basically. You have six core archetypes uh, medic, charmer, outlaw, hunter, fixer, and the merc. And of, of course, if you've ever played like WoW, you know, okay, there's a healer, there's the damaged guy, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So the archetypes is just giving people a baseline um, for starting skills and um, upgrade points. And, and they each have different uh, tricks as well. Yeah. So I just think of tricks as like, spells but without the magic and that that opens the door so basically i have a list of skills that are governed by the the traits you know Mm -hmm. same as a lot of games do so like perception is going to govern you know your sniping skill for example um anything that can't be covered by the skills can be put into the the tricks so basically, if you're coming up with your own little homebrew thing, I left it wide open so that if there was something that you wanted to be able to do that wasn't available in the other game mechanics, you could just make a trick. Um, and I got that inspiration from Magic the Gathering, actually. Because mm-hmm. I, I, before this, I, I experimented with... Um, I tried to make a bunch of different board games and card games mm-hmm. and actually learned a lot from that process because I'll just use magic as an example. I love magic because the core mechanic is so simple. You have one card with the cost. Uh, what, what do you have to spend to bring this card out? And then it has an attack and a defense. And that's it. That's the whole core and everything else, all the thousands and millions of possibilities in that game comes from just the, the flavor text and the, the, the instructions on the card and the keywords. Mm-hmm. So the, the possibilities are endless uh, for making a game like that. So my, my goal was to limit the core mechanics so that people could learn them quickly and easily and then have plenty of room to do whatever you wanted outside of those limitations. Which I can definitely get behind that that particular concept. Um, one of the other things that I was curious about when it came to archetypes, which I, def- I, um, I, which I definitely see a bit more broadly than the t- than a typical class system, which it which is far more set in its path more often than not. There's exceptions to the rule, obviously, because there's exceptions to every rule. But what I'm curious about is um, subtypes or sub arcs. Is the, 
Is that a is that more of a specialization that someone could pick up at a at a higher tier, or is it a case where it's a specialization they pick up at they could pick up at the start? And if so, is it an is it a optional thing that they can pick up with its own catch? Yeah. So uh, originally, my idea was to have the sub archetypes, and I I actually recently. Um, changed it so it's just archetypes now and theoretically you can have as many archetypes as you can think of basically and uh, so let me just go back and tell you how i make an archetype mm-hmm. so with with one archetype let's just say i'm making like a philosopher kind of character a sage or whatever mm-hmm. so i take the core archetype of one of the six because that gives me a baseline of uh the cost to upgrade certain things and from there all i do is i pick a combination of two skills so you have a primary skill and a secondary skill and so there's 48 skills so any two combinations (laughs) gives you i don't know how many uh possibilities and then of course you can create new archetype specific tricks so with that being said instead of having sub arcs uh i'm just removing that all together and keeping the archetypes so that you can technically have unlimited archetypes but i'm going to have the six core that are there as a baseline and really they're for new players to be able to just jump in because i I don't like creating a character for hours and hours. I want to be able to just grab a character sheet and play. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I know a a lot of people are like that as well. And then there's some people that want to tinker with the character forever. So basically that's the concept here. The sub arcs, it's just different archetypes um, in addition to the base six. So now you can basically start with any archetype you want, but there's always going to be those base six to kind of give a new player an idea of how to play. Um, And I chose those six very specifically because years ago I wrote, I wrote a blog post um, about back then it was the five people you need to Mm -hmm. survive an apocalypse. And that idea just stuck with me. It's like, well, you need a doctor kind of person. You need a negotiator kind of person, a soldier and a hunter. And and then I added the, the outlaw at the very end because I have six traits. And I'm always trying to keep the game balanced. So to answer your question, um, you can play. I have 24 archetypes right now. Mm-hmm. Um but I always felt like, okay, that that might be overwhelming to a brand new person. That's why I have the six. And then maybe I'll make like a another chapter or a supplement with extra archetypes in it. Um, but the idea behind upgrades, so there's no like specializations that you can do mm-hmm. later on and upgrade. So there's no um, levels. You just earn XP as you go, and then you do a point buy, just like an a la carte system. Because mm-hmm. you know, I might decide, shit, I need more health. <laughs> you know, I don't need another skill. I need health right now because um, I'm weak. Or you might choose to buy a new trick or whatever. You mm-hmm. might want to upgrade a combat skill yeah, like just so many different things and i wanted it that way like because because what i don't like about some other games where they tell you what you earned when you level up it's like well what if i discover i don't like playing that particular way um you you discover a lot of things as you go mm-hmm. that you might not have realized in the beginning so that's kind of like why I don't like video games that tie you to a specific skill tree. Once you start, you're stuck. 
in some cases. So I like to keep it open and let you pick the shit that you want to upgrade Yeah. whenever you want it. And I'm so get- you don't have to wait mm-hmm. to level up. Mm-hmm. You can just buy it whenever you have enough XP. Now, when it comes to the core die system, if I understand it the way the way you in, the way you intend, it's you roll the, you roll the trait and the skill is what you have to roll under for the um, trait die to be considered successes. Taking yep. that into account with what you with what you mentioned, um, is it a case where where buying into a skill initially is fa- is fairly cheap, but buying into the buying into the levels of say say above five would get a lot more expensive. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and to be honest with you, I that would be worth considering. I mm-hmm. mean, that's the smart way to do it. Um, because as you go and things get easier, you're going to earn more XP. And if everything stayed the same cost, uh, then you're going to get overpowered pretty quickly. I have to experiment, actually, with the uh, the upgrade costs of things. Because there's only one way to find out if it's balanced or overpowered or broken. Um, yeah, there's... So, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. There's of, there's of course also the issue of um of untrained skills because obviously if some if somebody do, the way you wrote it if somebody doesn't have any points then there's the whole thing of well that means that th- that it would be physically impossible for them to do the roll um because you can't because you can't roll a set of d- unless you're counting z ze- well actually I need I this is something I do need to clarify because some games do it one way some games do it the other since you're using d tens. Do you count zeros as tens, or do you count those as zeros? Yeah, the zero is a ten. All, all right, then that then that that's what I was guessing, which is what which is why the un, the question of unskilled rolls um, becomes a bit becomes a bit more of a factor, since if right. somebody is trying to do a skill that they don't have and that they don't have a skill score in. It it would it would be physically impossible for them to do the role, and I'm not saying that pe- that that's that um somebody should be shouldn't be penalized for doing it, but there's a difference, of course, between penalizing and it being impossible. Sure. No, I think uh, so. The idea is that if you don't have a, so your skills go from from one to ten, with ten being you're an expert. Um, and if you don't have any, then mm-hmm. you're automatically just a one. All right, that's the lowest you can have. So the idea is, like, let's say uh, you have a character who has a dexterity of seven, mm-hmm. but you're not very good at maybe sleight of hand. Uh, you've never practiced it, but you're still pretty coordinated. So you can you're going to get to roll seven dice. Um, and let's say that, uh, it's a pretty easy task. You're just trying to hide something. You're trying to, uh, slip something into your pocket without being seen or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say it's difficulty of three. It's fairly easy. So with your seven dice, because that's your dexterity score, you would simply need to roll three ones to succeed. So you still have a chance to succeed. The only time you don't have a chance to succeed is when... The task is harder than your trait, if that makes sense. The way I, the way that I describe this is, uh, if you like, say your perception is a five, and you're trying to see somebody <laughs> that's three miles away, that's going to be outside of your abilities, so to speak. So that's the only time that a, a task is technically impossible. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you always have a chance to still pull something off. And not to mention, I have a luck meter that you can use as well. So basically, I created uh, you can you can accrue luck points, and the way that works is uh, when when something terrible 
<laughs> anytime anything super shitty happens to a character, then I'll just give them a luck point. Like if you take a huge amount of damage or you fail miserably on a roll somewhere, mm-hmm. it'll give you a luck point that you can spend later. So all that is is um, you can alter the roll of a dice by however many luck points you spend. So let's say in that same example, you roll your seven dice and you need three ones, but let's say you only get two ones and one two, and the rest are like seven three. Mm-hmm. That one two, you could spend a luck point to change that two to a one. Because you got lucky. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you have three luck points to spend, and that die was a four, you could spend all three and go, hey, I got really lucky this time. And that's the whole idea. I'm trying to give people more options to succeed when they absolutely need to, rather than just have a whole bunch of things that characters can't do. I, my, I want to encourage people to try still mm-hmm. if they want to try something. And yeah, taking the, take now taking that into into um, account. Um, I'm curious. One of the things that I no, that I especially noticed when I looked at the um, prototype design you have for the character sheet on on your Twitter was the was the bar regarding influence because. Influence right. is certainly no is I'm um, is certainly something I'm no stranger to, when it comes to how when it comes to how it's handled in games, but the idea of having different degrees of influence is something that I haven't seen all that often the way you have it. How how do you have influence work in your system? So I wanted I wanted the influence to be separate from the skills, mm-hmm. um, and originally it wasn't. It was it was the same skill mechanic where. Each influence was tied directly to a, a trait. Mm-hmm. For example, psychological influence was from your aptitude. Um, and I didn't like it. I felt like the game was very monotonous. I wanted something different. So the influence now is you have six kinds of influence which are not tied to a trait. So those are not tied to anything. So you could be really kind of a dumb uh in, in, you could have a intellectually feeble character who's really good at psychological manipulation because mm-hmm. i i mean kids little kids can manipulate people you know so i i took that away um and now all it is is it's it's essentially a D, d20 but with two d10s so you have your six influence scores and when you create your character, you pick. You get a plus three, plus two, plus one, minus one, minus two, minus three. Mm-hmm. And that's your influence. And you put those however you want. And the influence has all the skills listed, and you just get those automatically. You don't have to put points into them. So all it is is um, you roll 2d10s, and then you add your influence score. And then you just do a comparison to the person's uh, resistance, I guess. And higher, it's just a dice comparison at that point. So that's how I did that. Um, And the influence can be, uh, you know, you can alter influence with consumables or negatively or positively. But that's that I wanted people to spend more time trying to influence other humans rather mm-hmm. than just trying to kill everybody <laughs> all the time. Uh, so I made it uh, a major part of the game mechanic, I guess. All right, I can get, I can, I can see where that's that's particularly going. Um, now, when it comes to now, I did take a look at the tricks that he, that arch, that archetypes have uh or rather tr- rather on trick ah english english is my first language 
I think. <laughs> yeah, archetype tricks is what I was think was what I was thinking of. Now, when I looked on the site, I saw that there were f that there were five each for the for for the archetypes. Do you have it planned that those are the only five that each archetype is going to have, or do you have planned that there will be that that um as the game develops, there will be more tricks available? Yeah, actually, I haven't updated the site since I so I my most recent thing that I added to the PDF that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Each archetype right now has ten tricks available, um, and I did that so that you could just roll <laughs> if you didn't want to pick. Because um, some people like rolling for a character. Mm -hmm. um, so each archetype has 10 tricks. And then I also have 10 tricks that are non-archetype specific. So anybody could pick those. Um, and then, of course, I want it so that as I come up with more, I can just put those somewhere and add them to the game. So the tricks... I don't want it to be limited. I want I and I want other people to think of tricks and you know, I just want that to be the, the it's like the flavor of each archetype like uh I can't think well I can think of one trick that's uh pretty like the medic trick. They have a trick called heal shit there. Mm -hmm. Basically they can they can distribute effects from a consumable among multiple players so in a pinch you know i can take a first aid kit and gain all of it you know but i can't share my first aid kit with anybody mm -hmm. but a medic can take that same first aid kit and go okay you need some health and you need some health here you know so that's a trick that's like the those are the ideas that i had for archetype tricks um yep. and I, I definitely want to come up with more but right now there's 10 per archetype mm -hmm. so now when it come now um when i saw the character sheet along with it i saw hitches were would hitches be on the opposite end of the spectrum regarding tricks i.e their um ne their negative effects yeah yep yeah and i felt like that that was uh the best way to balance out um these characters because naturally everybody's going to want to try to make their character as either powerful or you know streamlined as possible mm -hmm. but very rarely does a game make you uh well i mean there's other games out there that do this but you, to force you to pick like some limitation um to kind of round out your character and i thought i'll just use the hitches for that so in the beginning when you create a character i'm going to have a, a list of hitches that everyone has to pick one um and that kind of it just makes the game more it just pops more mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and i don't know what's mm -hmm. what has your experience been with games like that that caught that have you do that um there are th when it comes to when it comes to freeform build when it comes to freeform builds or ga games that games that have a freeform style of character creation there are a f there are a few tendencies that i see and some of them i i am not too proud to admit i'm just as guilty of um you of course have the people who want to game it to make the most broken character that they can um that's not a criticism of anybody's of system. It's just how people are, how some people are going to be wired. Um, yeah, you I have... think there's going to be people that break. They want to break. There's any every system can be broken in some way. I think you have some cases where pe where people will try and find the the closest to an equilibrium spread that they can. Like for example, if you have a case where you have say six um, core attributes. In a point by set, a point by setup, where it's a straight point by, not a um, point by conversion like some like certain versions of D and D might might have, or um, or so, or something something like here something like Hero System or GURPS have. Um, in those instances, the person would t would take the 
would take the number of attributes they have, then divide it by the total amount, and then try and distribute as evenly as possible. Um, yeah. And then you have then you have others who are going to try and gear themselves for survivability as much as possible. Um, right. Neither. For for me, when it com when it the only the only real problem that I've always had when it comes to free when it comes to freeform systems is ma is making it cl is making it clear what's what's a good what's a good and what's a not so good idea for particular builds. I've spent a lot of time looking at threads on different forums about build optimization and that kind of thing because a lot of times people people will write in just the basics and then they'll push you into the into the deep end of the swimming pool and just say swim damn it as your only instructions <laughs> because it, it's yeah. in this whole debate about whether or not to make something appealing for rookies or appealing to veterans the people who are in the middle ground tend to get the least amount of help where they they know the basics but they but they might they might want a little bit of assistance in terms of how to how to um how to build how to make certain builds that aren't necessarily standard fare. Um, right. And with now whether or not whether or not that's going that's going to be the case with Rainwall, I I realize that's a tricky thing to address, but I do think it is possible. An easy way to, an easy way to address it is just is just when talking about the individual traits what it's going to in, what it's going to influence like say okay if you, okay if you have a high strength you're get, it's going to affect and then a set of bullet points about what that'll affect if you've got a low strength same same thing or when it comes to tr when it comes to the um archetypes the the whole suggestions of what traits you might want to focus on if you're picking that particular archetype yeah, I have those in the uh, PDF that I'm making right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you go. But I so I basically want to do a couple of things. Like, I'm gonna have the ready to go, mm -hmm. pre-made character that you can just take, and then I'm also gonna have the, hey, here are some things that this archetype might want to pick, you know, uh, as their skills, or you might want to put more points into this or that. Yeah. yeah. Um, one experiment that I've seen a few people do, and this and this might be this might be um, for consideration as a intermediate type of character creation, is a package based system. Okay. Um, yeah. Where in, instead of instead of just one preset, you have the, you have each you have a set of um, preset packages for each major step, and have people mix and match it. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. Oh. Yeah, yeah. For now, uh, yeah, for now, I'm just trying to focus on the, the beginners to get people in. Like, okay, here, come on in, open the door. Like the sampler. You know, when you go to the mall, they got the little pieces of uh, chicken or whatever. Here, take oh. this. Oh um, yeah, also also known as portions <laughs> for people smaller than me. <laughs> right. Yeah, they just want to get you in the door, and then you can look at the full menu mm -hmm. and make your your final decision. So yeah, that's a good idea, though. I could, mm -hmm. they can definitely put together some different builds yeah. to give more options. Sure. So, and give, given the um, even though you're not using it, given the sub archetypes, you already have a framework that you could that you could build around in that sense. Yeah, for sure, with different archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, and I could, I could still. It, it, a lot of it is up it is up in the air. Um, I could still decide. Okay, you start out with this with a core archetype, and then as you go, maybe I can say for X amount of XP, you can specialize in this sub archetype, and then you get access to new tricks, all mm -hmm. that or whatever. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of possibilities. But that being said, I, I know you're developing this this playtest version of the P, of the PDF. Um, I realize that these kind of things are in are in flux because 
Um, this is a because unless I'm mistaken, this is a largely one per one person show with some with some other people helping out when it comes to um, art and visual design. But what do you see as a release window for that PDF? Are you thinking? So are you thinking sometime late this year? Are you thinking sometime in 2022? Or is it completely up in the air as far as what time you might see it happen? Uh, to be honest with you, because I spend a lot of free time on it, um, mm -hmm. I would say that this summer, actually, because I have a lot of the work done. Mostly, it's it's me hammering out the finer details and just building the PDF. Cause I do all the graphic design cause I did that. I did that for years. Um, and I enjoy it <laughs> and I'm not too bad at it. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm the one I made the character sheet and that's like the sixth or seventh character sheet rehaul <laughs> that I've done. And I'm finally happy with how that one came out. But, uh, yeah, I have art people coming mm -hmm. in, but yeah, for sure. Um, the, the beginning, the, the, Basic player's guide, I'm going to try to have it ready within the next few months, honestly. Um, I'm, like I'm, th this is the only thing I do in my spare time. So. <laughs> and when it comes to the character sheet, I'm curious if you plan on doing a form-fillable version of that. Uh, yeah, I can add that to my list, for sure. Um, I'll just have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just have to make. I just have to knuckle down and make it, make yeah. one. And, and I, I also plan to do something with D twenty, or the Roll Twenty website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm. I realize that it might that it might be tr it might be tricky to do both at once, but I would consider Foundry as well. Okay. I'm just I'm just put. I don't have any affiliation with them. I'm just putting that name out there. Yeah, no. Any ideas mm -hmm. that you all can, anybody throws my my way, I'm definitely going to consider everything. Because um, I just want to make it accessible, you know, to as many people, to anybody who wants it. Mm -hmm. And I understand too that a lot of people don't actually play; they just like to read the stuff and look at the art. So mm -hmm. I'm cool. I'm cool with that too. Um, I'd, one thing I wanted to uh, mention before, at some point, did you look at the hunger meter? I did. On the character sheet? I did do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, that's actually the single, that's my favorite mechanic in the whole game. Um, and it came about because when we were playtesting it, the, the original way of getting your health back was just like the standard video game style. You just collect food or first aid stuff, and you use it, and you get your health back. And we were playtesting that. It was so boring. We'd collect all these, you know, you'd find, because it's the apocalypse, I have scavenging. I have just random items thrown around and you find, oh, I found a can of beans, mm -hmm. you know, or I found this and you'd eat it and you get your health back. But we felt that that was very boring. And we also felt that it was too easy. It didn't feel like the apocalypse. So what I did was I created this health meter and you have basically three things that hunger affects. And basically the idea is that every 12 hours, your hunger meter goes down by one. Mm -hmm. And at, at over time, that hunger meter will affect a different meter that's on your list. So you have vitality, which is your physical health, uh, your sanity, which is your mental health, and you have your morale, which is like your emotional health. And as the hunger meter goes down, these other meters go down too. But mm -hmm. when those meters go down that affects other things in the game. So, you know, for example, my vitality goes down by one. So now I'm not as strong because I'm super hungry or mm -hmm. whatever. You know, all of that. And the, the coolest part is each of those meters goes down at a different rate. 
and you get to pick which one you want to go down faster, medium, or slower. So you could have a character that is strong physically and very resilient, but your morale goes down really fast. So you get pissed off whenever you're hungry. <laughs> um, and so all that stuff is affected in this game. And once we played that, uh, it really, I don't know, it kind of amplified the apocalypse feel of everything um, because of the hunger having an effect. And yeah, but one thing I don't want is the game to just be like a craft fest <laughs> where you just go around scavenging junk and then making things. Um, but I do have that in there for people who like crafting. Mm -hmm. And with it, and I'll def I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how how um, Rainwall develops and how people find new and interesting ways to break it because that's going to happen. If it, if I don't do yeah. it, somebody else will. <laughs> right. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. No, man, yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'll mm -hmm. definitely come back later once I get more done and mm -hmm. once I release that PDF, I'll let you know for sure. Oh, I definitely appreciate that. And uh, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Nice. Well, I'm going to go have a drink right now, then. <laughs> so. Yep. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>